Hi, I'm Roxy. Regulars on my channel know me for my illustrations and digital brushes, but I'm also a qualified and seasoned graphic designer. So when Corel reached out wanting to know if I was interested in taking a look at the latest Corel Draw, it was an easy yes from me, given that I've been using Corel Draw software for two decades already anyhow. So I was happy to snag a copy of the new one and take a look. During my 23 year career, I've used CorelDRAW for every single logo I've designed and for the titles of all the book covers I've illustrated. I've used it for signage, business cards, brochures and even educational illustrations. So it's a powerhouse and I'd happily choose it hands down over any other vector program. Now, I suspect many of you watching will be a lot more familiar with Corel Painter than Corel Draw. So, I thought before we dive into the review of Corel Draw 2024, I'd quickly explain how Corel Draw differs from Corel Painter and other apps that you typically see me using for illustration on this channel. If you already understand vectors and rasters, feel free to skip ahead. The video is timestamped. So, there are two kinds of images, vector and raster. Raster images, like JPEGs, PNGs and GIFs, are made up of pixels. And you can actually see these individual pixels in some programs if you zoom in far enough. Each pixel can have a separate color, which is why raster images can be gloriously complex, such as digital photographs and illustrations that look like proper paintings. If I enlarge a raster image, it adds more pixels to the document, but the program has to guess what color each new pixel will be filled with. And the algorithm isn't always perfect, so this upscaling can often result in somewhat blurry pixelated images. Vector images, like an SVG, WMF, EPS, etc., are different. These files aren't made up of pixels, but rather lines and shapes. Even if you zoom in at a pixel level, a gradient will still look smooth. Each line and shape is made up of one color or an editable gradient. And when you enlarge a vector file, it doesn't lose quality. It will always be super crisp at any size, and that's why they're perfect for logos, which often need to be printed at vastly different sizes from as small as fitting on a pen to as large as, say, company signage. That's the upside of a vector, that lossless quality. The downside is that they're never going to be as richly complex as a raster image. And that's why we use a raster program like Corel Painter for complex illustrations and we use a vector program like Corel Draw for flatter graphics and logos. If you make an image in a raster program like Corel Painter, you can only export it in raster formats like JPEG, for example. If you make an image in a vector program like Corel Draw, you can export it in a vector format like SVG or a raster format like PNG which is helpful for logos because you'll often need to export it in a variety of formats for different purposes. Maybe on your email signature, you need it as a PNG, but the printer wants it as a vector PDF for your building signage. So hopefully I've done an okay job of explaining the difference. And now I just wanna show you what I specifically use CorelDRAW for. And there are three main things. The first thing is creating logos. This is a CorelDRAW document showing my logo design process. You can see I draw shapes and symbols. I play with fonts. I pull it all together. I manipulate them. I discard them. I work on iterations of one thing or completely different versions, all within a multi-page document. And after client approval, I also use CorelDRAW to create a corporate identity document and export it as a PDF. The second thing is book cover titles. When I get a book cover commission, I'll do the illustration itself in a raster program, but for the main title text, I always start in CorelDRAW. 
I start out by typing out the title in different fonts. And then when I find a winner, I adjust the kerning, convert it to curves, chop off bits I don't like, maybe even warp it. It's such a pleasure to do in Corel Draw. Once I have my title, I export it as a high res PNG, pull it into the cover where I might paint over it or add some styling to it. But Corel Draw's part in this process is irreplaceable. The third thing I frequently use Corel Draw for is vectorization. Corel Draw has a built in vectorization tool that actually does a pretty good job of converting a raster into a vector. As an example, this is a logo I created. The text and the circular border I created straight in Corel Draw. I pulled this border into a raster program and then I painted the mascot inside it. Then I exported that as a high res JPEG, pulled it back into Corel Draw and used the vectorization tool to turn my painting into a vector uh, so that I could use it as a logo for my client. So those are the three things that I typically use Corel Draw for, but let's have a look at what's new in 2024. When I say 2024, I'm talking about the one that's called Corel Draw Graphics Suite. Later in the video, we'll look at all the different 2024 versions because that's a whole nother confusing topic. But right now, we want to see how Corel Draw Graphics Suite 2024 differs from previous versions. I found this table and we'll use that as a, as a basis to start from. Uh, in the first column, we've got this subscription version, which has some extra stuff like more brushes, uh, cloud based management and more templates. I don't use templates or cloud storage, so that doesn't tempt me. And I also don't rent software. But I do understand it. Having a monthly cost for cloud storage is fair, obviously, because it takes up server space. So if you want that, you'll need the subscription version. But for this particular video, we're going to be looking at a couple of things in the second column, which is for the persistent license and compare it with 2023 and 2021 one time purchase versions. So these are the versions that you don't rent, you just buy it straight up. First thing on the list is the painterly brush tool. Uh, for many versions, Corel Draw has had the artistic media tool, which I've used often over the years. You can draw with it or you can apply it to an existing line. It's like a line style. And now we have a painterly brush, which works in exactly the same way. You can draw with it or you can apply it to a line or shape. You can even apply it to text. Change the line width and there's a whole bunch of different styles that you can toggle between. From what I can tell, there is no pressure sensitivity built in. I tried drawing this using my graphics tablet and it looks and behaves exactly the same way as if I used a mouse. Um, so a pity <laughs> that that wasn't the case, but it definitely has promise. Some of these I could see coming in handy. Next thing on the list is more Pantone colors. Now I'm going to be honest with you in my 20 plus years of being a graphic designer, I think I can count on one finger where a client wanted a specific Pantone color. So personally don't care, but certainly print shops and reaper houses, many of whom use Corel Draw, will appreciate that it's built in. Um, as I understand it, you need a separate Pantone subscription if you're working with Adobe products. So at least there's no extra cost for that if you're into Pantone colors. Remote fonts. So according to this document, once remote fonts have been enabled, the font list box displays a cloud icon for online fonts that aren't downloaded and installed, as well as any font that's found on your system but not installed. Now there's two places that you can toggle it on. You can either go to Tools, Options, Corel Draw, Text, Fonts, and then toggle on Enable Remote Fonts over here, or if you're using the font tool, click the drop down arrow where, you're, where you find your fonts, click the gear icon, click font list options, and it takes you directly here so you can enable remote fonts. When I first toggled it on and tried to select one of the fonts with the cloud icon, 
My PC came to a standstill. At first I thought it might be due to the fact that I have 2 gigs of uninstalled fonts on my PC. I know that sounds excessive, but you tend to accumulate these things after years in the industry. But I don't think it was using my fonts uh, because I checked the first 5 fonts of my personal collection and they aren't here. So it could be that the ones it did find are actually off the internet, like Google Fonts for example. And my internet connection is quite primitive, so that might explain the lag out. Anyway, eventually it did become usable again and I see I can switch between these fonts. So I guess that's cool. Still would have been nice if it loaded all my personal fonts too. Not a biggie though, I do use a program called Nexus to load my uninstalled fonts into applications for use and it works like a charm. If you're only using CorelDRAW, Corel has its own font manager which I'm sure would work perfectly. I know my friend Verity uses it and she loves it. It comes bundled with CorelDRAW so it doesn't cost you any extra either. Non-destructive effects. So this refers to the bitmap effects tab in the properties docker. For this demonstration I've imported my default profile pic and then if I select that and press plus now there's a bunch of effects that I can use. I can apply a halftone filter, I can hide that effect, that's what it means by non-destructive because it doesn't affect the original. I can apply something else Let's go for Distort Mesh Warp. I can increase the grid size, give myself a lazy eye. I can have both effects on at the same time. I can delete one of them. Now, most of these effects seem to be geared towards photos, but you can also apply this onto vector objects. For example, if we grab some text, select it and click plus. Let's add some noise. There's a few things we can fiddle with here. So again, a feature that has some promise. Definitely some people will be excited about that. Next up we've got focus mode. To use it, uh, right click on the thing you're busy with and click bring into focus. You'll see it fades out everything else. Obviously this is not necessary for a simple situation like this, but I can imagine someone working on a complex vector file where certain pieces, shapes are the same color like this for example and then if we go into focus mode we can see it clearly so that's very useful glad they've added that then there's some other stuff here which is mostly technical stuff that won't interest most people but i do want to show you a couple of features which are not listed as new but they certainly weren't in my old version uh, version 17 so they're new to me and the first one is dark mode for that we go into Tools, Options, Customization and here in Appearance we can choose Medium, Dark and Black. That is much easier on the eyes and if you have a modern OLED monitor you'll also save a little bit of electricity by having it on this mode. The second feature I've discovered is that I can paste screenshots from the clipboard directly into CorelDRAW 2024. As an example, if you press Windows Shift S to bring up the built-in screenshotting application, draw a selection around something and then press Ctrl V in Corel Draw, it pastes it in here uh, without any issues. <laughs> in my previous version, you'd get an error saying that the specified data format is not available. So loving that, that's going to save me a lot of time. And the last thing I want to show you this isn't even a new feature, mind you. My CorelDRAW 17 had it, but I love it so much. And so few people know about it for some reason. If you press Control shift e your cursor turns into an eyedropper. But it's not just any old eyedropper. You can move it outside of the program and color pick from outside of CorelDRAW. And the color appears within CorelDRAW. Now, I've been saying for ages that Corel Painter needs that, but... Anyway, just an awesome little feature and I wanted to share that. Okay, so for versions. When you go to buy Corel Draw, you'll see that there's a lot of different options and it's not that obvious what the differences are. And there are big differences. 
This on the end is CorelDRAW Graphics Suite. This is the correct version with all the features that I've been showing you. With CorelDRAW Standard, you get a severely stripped down version of CorelDRAW, which is different from the version included in Graphics Suite. It doesn't have the painterly brushes I just showed you. It doesn't even have CMYK color mode. Personally, I don't see what the point of the software is because it's, it's even more expensive than the proper one. Well, this is in RANDs. Let's just check out on a VPN. Okay, so if you're using dollars, it's a little bit cheaper, but not much. But basically what I'm saying is ignore the standard version. The one you want is CorelDRAW Graphics Suite. Uh, lastly, we, we have CorelDRAW Essentials, which is much cheaper and I'm assuming is a much more stripped down version. So again, that's not the one you want. Um, CorelDRAW Graphics Suite, this is the one, whether you go with a rented version or whether you go for the persistent version. Corel have very graciously supplied me with a time sensitive voucher, which my viewers can use. Uh, in the description, you'll find my affiliate link, which will give me some commission at no cost to you. So appreciate it very much. If you, if you do decide to buy it, please use my affiliate code and you can use voucher Roxy for 10% off Corel Draw Graphics Suite. That wraps it up. Thank you to my patrons and thank you for watching. Much obliged if you leave a like and subscribe. Until the next one, God bless.